foundation course. Um, and it was, it was okay. But it, you know, it was like uh, art college in England tends to be for people who don't really know what they want to do. And I knew that I wanted to draw comics. Um, and so I got onto a, an illustration degree in Manchester. But I kind of realized that I really didn't want to spend the next three or four years drinking, really. Um, well, <laughs> not on a university. <laughs> uh, so, so I did a, a business course for a year instead. So I knew the ins and outs of how to run uh, my, my passion as, as a business. Uh, and I think that's what everybody should do. There should be a year of a business course at art college because so many artists don't understand business whatsoever. Um, so I, I did that and that's when I started. To, I started working as a graphic designer, really. Um, but then I got to the point where it's like, well, if I don't make the decision now to illustrate comics, I'm, I'm going to regret it. Um, like just before I got my first work, I was, I was offered a job uh, with a computer game company. And they were giving me the salary and they said, okay, we want you permanently. And that very evening I got my first 2080 work. And I'm like, no, if, if, I, if I don't do this, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. Although the computer game job probably would have been paid better. Mm, probably at the beginning, but at the point I am now, I doubt it. So, um, how long did it uh, take from 2008 um, to develop to Marvel and go uh, with the, uh, the whole US uh, right. scenery? Well, I was, I was working on 2008 and then um, I, I started to pick up work uh, for Caliber Comics, which was a very small press uh, comic company in, uh, in the kind of mid-90s. And uh, it is quite intriguing that most of the people who worked for Caliber at that time, they're now the, the guys who are leading the industry. Like, like Brian Bendis, uh, Baker, Michael Lark, you know, all these guys who were working at, at Caliber at the same time. So that was our, our starting ground, really. Um, but they, they, they didn't pay anything, it was, it was awful. Um, but the thing was, at that point, I was, I was actually living in Poland. Because um, my, my wife, my girlfriend at the time, was Polish. So I was living over there. And I could do a 2008 job. And the money on like a five-page 2008 job would last me three months in Poland. <laughs> so that enabled me to do all the free American work. Because for the American industry, it was more about have you been published? Have you been published in the American country? <coughs> so that was more of a calling card. So, you know, that, I knew how important it was to do it, even if I wasn't getting paid, really. Um, and, it, and it was very important. Um, and it, it's, it's incredibly important to, to, to have that experience of being published in a monthly comic because it, it trains you so well. What comic books have, has uh, Caliber done at this time? Um, well, I, Anything we, we know? Um, they did adaptations of uh, Necroscope, uh, which is Brian Lumley, horror. Um, I, I, I did an adaptation of Dr. Faustus. I think most Germans know Dr. Faustus, right? Um, it was written by a German guy. And, uh, <laughs> so I did an adaptation of that. Uh, with Mike Carey, um, and we, uh, I was also working on Black Nest, Kilroy, um, I, was, I was all over the place over there. They, they had an anthology comic called Negative Burn, which was very famous in the mid-90s, and it was, um, that was great, just, just a short story, get it out there. Um, and then it was a great anthology in respect to all these guys I was mentioning, they, they got their start there. So yeah, it was, it was a fantastic working experience to do that. Then that kind of that kind of led to to other work uh, in England as well with Games Workshop. Um, and then I was, I was I was in a pub. Most most comic stories begin. I was in a pub, 
That's that's actually true. Yeah. <laughs> Even my comic story starts with uh, started with not a pub but with a lot of beers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I was in a pub and I was talking to um, Phil Winslade, and uh, Phil was complaining that he couldn't find anybody to ink his work, um, and so I was just like, well, I'll have a go. And so we, I, he gave me some pages, and I started inking, and I started picking up inking work. And the American market is very it's, it's totally different than the uh, British market in the respect that in the, the British comics you do everything: you pencil, you ink, you color. Sometimes you do your own lettering. Um, but the American market was very segmented. You know, you have one penciler, one inker, one colorist. Um, and so um, I started picking up inking work. The editors loved my inking work, and uh, I started doing that. And then that kind of led to uh, Crossgen Comics. And Crossgen was a company which were creating their own comics, but as opposed to most other companies where you, you are freelance and you send the work in, Crossgen wanted everybody to work in-house. And so you would have the writer, the penciler, the inker, the colorist, all in one area just discussing it. It was a very great atmosphere. Um, but of course they wanted everybody working in house. Um, so they, they were, we, we went over to check it out in Florida. And um, me and my wife were like, okay, we'll go for three years, make some contacts, and, and head back after that. And um, that was in 2001, we started left. Yeah. Uh, but but Crossgen, it was fantastic. But fortunately, it went under uh, in 2004, and I was I was there on a work visa, um, and so uh, basically, if 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 I was kicked out, if if I had to leave the company, I had to leave the country because it was a work visa, and so they they shut the doors. I got into my car, and my phone rang. And it was Marvel, and they said, we'll take care of your visa, don't worry about it, just sign an exclusive with us and we'll be fine. So I was like, oh, go on then. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's, that's really how Marvel work started. And, and that was, I was back to penciling and inking my own stuff at that point. So how long exactly did you work in North Marvel? I was, I was exclusive with them for 14 years. That's, a, that's an absolute long time. They, they left me. <laughs> so, what have you? What, are, what characters have you done in this period of fourteen years? Uh, I, would, I would say the, the most the most famous runs that I did was Captain America, because uh, it was the the Winter Soldier stuff where most of that has now been in the films. So it was actually nice to see the stuff on the big screen of things I've worked on. Uh, and also uh, the, the uh, stand, the Stephen King adaptation, which uh, that was like a 31 issue adaptation of the stand, and that, that was a thrill to work on. Uh, I did root that pretty much after straight after Captain America, uh, so that was that was fantastic. Just getting emails from from Stephen King. And did you ever met him? No, no, no. no. Really? No, no. no, he he was very much he was. He had to approve all the character sketches and everything like that, and he, he would he would look at them and I'd get these emails raving, basically going, "This is exactly how I saw the character when uh, I first created them for the book," and uh, and that was a relief because you know these books have been made by millions of people, and every single person has their own idea of what the character is. Um, and so the, uh, when Stephen King says that's that's the character, I you can you know everybody else can. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to watch my language. <laughs> that probably means you have a very crazy mind because yeah. if you if you can think like Stephen King, yeah. 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 Sure. And then when the issues were coming out, he would send me emails and go like, oh, I'm like a kid in a candy shop every time a new issue comes out. And, uh, and so it was, and we we keep in touch. We keep in touch because. Um, like last year, when, when the hurricane came through, because he lives down in Florida uh, as well, uh, when, the, when, the, uh, when the hurricane came through, we were, we were in touch. They say, are you okay? Are you okay? 
So it's actually pretty nice. You've got somebody of this caliber basically saying, Call me Steve. It's nice. So his, his son, Joe Hill, um, yes. uh, he, he's also a big comic book fan. Yeah. Did, uh, did they um, ever approach him if you probably should do uh, some of his stuff? Not really, because he tends to create his own stuff. So when, when you're exclusive of Marvel, you can't really go out to that bounce. I, I mean, I, I have done my own creator own book, um, but I had to fit it around Marvel. Um, and it's, they, they published it opinion, actually. Uh, it was, what, Rowan's Rise over here? Yeah, Rowan's yeah, Rise. Rowan's Rise in England. Mike Carey wrote that one. Uh, but unfortunately, they sold out at the Panini booth this weekend. So. You'll have to get it elsewhere. <laughs> did you did you get credits on, on the Winter Soldier movie? Uh, no, no, because most of that was was started by Steve, by Steve acting. So they, they just go to the original creator of that thing. Because he created Winter Soldier. And I just came along to help. I actually came along to help Steve out, because he was in a bind. Um, so I helped him out and then they were saying, well can you ink the book permanently? And I turned them down. I'm like, I was like, no, because I'm trying to re-establish myself as a pencil inker. I don't just want ink. And, uh, and then they turned around and said, well, do you want a pencil and ink alternate arts and ink Steve when he needs help? And I was like, yes, that's great. You know, so that's, that's how we worked on Captain America. So um, you have done like, like everything. Like, you have done pencils, you have done inks, and you have and complete stuff. Yeah. Um, some some people say the inker is more important than the penciler because the inker in the end chooses the line. Well, the inker is, is what you see on the page. Yeah, exactly. So would, would you also think that the inker is the more important part than the penciler? No. Uh, I, would, I would say I would say he he has a responsibility. I mean, it, it's, it's the storytelling beats which are the most important. Um, and the, the Inca can refine that or he can ruin it. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, I've worked with good Incas in the past, but it's, it's never my work on, on the page at the end of the day. So I, I want to, that's why I prefer to pencil the ink. I'm too much of a control freak, I guess. But, but saying that, I, I also love inking other artists because you learn so much from them. And I, you know, I, I've, been, I've been in a great position to ink some of the, the best artists, like, like George Perez and a bunch of guys, uh, Rick Leonardi, who look over to people. And, and there's still a bunch of artists out there that I still love to ink. Um, so, you know, it, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's not the main, the main focus, but then again, it's, I, when, I, when I'm doing my own stuff now, I hardly even pencil, I do most of the drawing and the inks. Um, especially when I was working on, on Carnage, which is just, it's all flowing in lines. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a totally different approach. And I, and I guess that comes from the trust between me and the, and the company. So, um, and you have done, naturally you have done um, interior pages, but you also have done covers, like this wonderful variant we sell at the booth. Yes. There's still it's some advertising left. opportunity. Yeah, there's some, some, some left, not much, but uh, some of them are left. Actually, that, that one was, it was a special variant cover to tie in with the first ant -Man movie that came out. And all of these covers, the, the figure was actually printed at ant size on the, on the cover. And then, and then on the back of it was the actual size of the, the thing. But yeah, they were all printed at ant size. So, do you like, what do you like more? Uh, if you drawing and size. <laughs> size, <laughs> like, yeah, covers or interior. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like storytelling, uh, so I, I, I really enjoy the interior, really. I, I enjoy drawing covers, I prefer to draw covers of, if I'm drawing interior, I want to draw covers as well, and that's not always the case. Yeah. Um, but, it's, yeah, I, you get into comics that tell stories. And you can do that in a single image, but just the, the aspect of being a storyteller, it, it's, it's exciting. 
So most of the artists I know, they tell me they can make like one page per day. Yeah. So how fast are you? That's, that's pretty much, it's one page per day. It's it's pencils, pencils, pencils and inks. And inks. Yeah. 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 Um, I can work faster, but I prefer to work with that rate because an, an American comic is 20 pages. And if you, if you want weekends free, then you break that 20 pages down into a month, and that's your month. You know, if you do the covers, you do them at the weekends, or you try and fit them around that, that base. But if you're on a monthly comic, then, you know, a page per day, you have to do it. You, you have to deliver it. Yeah. 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 So, and um, is it um, like a real working day? Uh, I heard from, from other artists, yeah. I, yeah, I, I work for an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this, that's the romantic uh, thinking of some of the fans. Oh yeah, I can, I can draw, I, I want to be a comic book yeah. professional. In the evening, I'm sitting there with a glass of wine and <laughs> draw for an hour and everything, so... But, well, some of them do that. Yeah. Well, at, at least drinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when, I, when I was in uh, Munich, at the Munich Festival a few years back, there were a whole bunch of people on the stage. A bunch of, a bunch of because it was a British thing. And so all these uh, other colleagues of mine were on the stage. And somebody in the, in the crowd asked, you know, what's your typical day like? So I was about fifth along. It was a big panel. Uh, I was about the fifth person along. And all the way along, all these people who, they're, they're English, but they were living in England, whereas I live in Florida. So they were going along and they were like, well, I go down to my basement and I look up and then there's grey rain everywhere and I sit there and get some work done and I might take the dog for a walk and I have to take my umbrella and I'm just sweating <laughs> <laughs> okay and they get to me and it's like what's your, what's your day like and I said well I get up at 6 o'clock I, uh, I go on the elliptical for a while and then um, I have breakfast I look out the, the window and there's blue skies, <laughs> palm trees, and uh, I get to like 1.30 in the afternoon and you're feeling a little tired. So I go and do 50 laps of my swimming pool <laughs> and they're all like, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a work, it, it, you know, people often say that if you find a job that you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life again. That's uh, just not true. It really, it really can be hard work. It can be exhausting and mentally exhausting as well. So yeah, so it is the truth. The most artists I have I've met, they tell me it is like a, a regular day job. It belongs to how long you can concentrate or whatever. But in, in the most of them, they stand up really early in the morning, but I, I cannot stand. And then they they work like seven hours, like regular day, yeah, yeah. and then they have. Uh, in the evening, they probably have time to do whatever they want or yeah. do their own stuff. Yeah. And then I met some others. They say, "Well, I cannot do that on on a longer uh, scale. Like completely be staying focused. Uh, they work work two hours and then have a break and, and right. another work hours, and and they won't close and uh, their their work until like two o'clock in the morning." Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I was when I was working on the Romans Ruin uh, stuff, the creator own book. I had to fit it around the Marvel work because that was my contract basically said the Marvel work comes first. Um, so I had to fit it around that and I really wanted to do this book. So I was, I was getting up at 4 o'clock and I was working on the Robin's Ruin until 10 o'clock. Then I would put it aside and then start working on Carnage until 6 o'clock. And then by 8 o'clock I was, I was, I was gone. I, I just crashed out, but then I would get up again at four o'clock, and I did that for like four months. Um, by the end of it, I was a bit crazy, um, and it's not good for your health to work like that, to do two books a month. It's just not good. Um, but it was a case of it was just inside me to get it out. So, and um, as I said, as to, to finish that, um, you have to deliver. So, if you are uh, ill 
or if you are uh, yeah, if you're ill, you don't make any money. Yeah, if you're on vacation right. or if you want to go to a con, right. you have somehow to get the, the, the missing time in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, before this convention, I, I was working extra time in the previous two weeks just to just to get ahead on my work. Like my deadline, they loved it because like my deadline for the, the latest issue I've been doing is like next Monday, but I finished the pre like Saturday just gone, um, and and the um, that was because I've got this I've got this this festival. Then I'm going with uh, Panini on a tour around different comic shops around Germany uh, in Leipzig, Hanover. Yeah, I guess Esslingen, Esslingen Stuttgart, yeah. yeah. But I do not know the whole tour. Yeah, and then, and then I'll be in Strasbourg next weekend for the convention over there. Um, and, then, and then I'll fly on to Poland, which is where my wife and daughter are. Because we, we tend to spend summer over here. Because nobody wants to be in Florida in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's go back to the, uh, to the movies. Um, how did how did you like the the movies of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? The have you seen them at all? Most of them, most of them. The the best one, in my opinion, and it's not a, just a personal thing, is the Winter Soldier. Um, and and I think that's basically because it just happens to be a thriller, which just happens to have a superhero in it. You know, it feels more like a real film than a, than a Marvel. Um, for me, I I like them. Um, I like them a lot, but I was kind of surprised at the response to Avengers when it came out, the first film, simply because everybody was raving about it. And I saw it and I was like, it, 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 for me it was more of the perception of the general public of how they see comics, mm. rather than me as a comic reader knowing what comic, the comics can have more depth. Um, and so that was the, yeah. I mean, I enjoyed it, but not to the extent that the general public did. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love the Wonder Woman, uh, apart from the last section where the CGI fight comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the actual character development, and the, it's, it's taking place in the war and everything, is brilliant. Um, but yeah, it's, that, I think, I think the, the Winter Soldier is probably the best. Okay. Have you seen the, the actual um, Deadpool? I haven't, I haven't seen, I haven't, been, I haven't left my drawing board for uh, <laughs> two years now. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I haven't really seen, seen that much of anything. I think the last time I went to the cinema was, I think I saw Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Oh no, I saw, I saw the Star Wars stuff. So, so I haven't seen so much. So the rest of you, you're watching in between on your computer when it's... Uh, no, 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 the, the, you know, the only thing we kind of watch at home, um, it, it's kind of strange, it's like the only thing we, we, when we finish, when I finish my work, I sit down with my wife, my daughter who's eight years old, she's gone to bed. So the only thing that we watch is, is English murder mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> Into that and all this kind of stuff. Midsummer murders. It's great. So, yeah, so, yeah. Actually, my wife's favorite program is uh, it's, a, it's a Rosemary and Time. I don't know if you have it over here. But it, it's a favorite thing because it's murder mystery and gardening. It's <laughs> So I probably don't ask you about the Netflix small series. I haven't seen any of them. Bizarrely enough, I haven't seen any of them. I've had dealings with those guys, and I've met some of the people from it. Um, and, and so, you know, it's always, it's always great to meet those guys. There, there was um, uh, the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. guys got in touch with me, and they wanted uh, Brett Dalton, who was the, the good-looking guy with the the dark hair and the first few series, um, he was leaving the show. So they wanted a piece of the transition of his character yeah, throughout yeah, the yeah. show to give to him on his last day. And um, he, uh, he got in contact with me afterwards and he was like, this is so good, this is really, really good. excellent. And then um, two weeks after that, I get, the, get another email from him 
was a couple of years ago, and he's like, I'm going to be in Stuttgart. You'll be in Stuttgart. Let's get together. So uh, we got on, we just got on really well together. And uh, the, uh, another time I was in Tampa uh, for a convention, and Brett was there. So we met her, and uh, I, later on, I'm in the, <laughs> I'm in the bar. And, uh, <laughs> I sent him a message. This is going to get a bit dirty. Um, I sent him a message saying, I'm in the bar, uh, come down, and then we'll go and get some to eat. And he comes down, and he's like, dude, you got me in so much trouble. And I'm like, why? What's wrong? He said, well, when I was in Stuttgart, my phone wasn't working, so I was using my wife's phone. She just phoned me up and said, I don't want to be a cock blocker, but you've got somebody in the bar waiting. <laughs> Did it because my name wasn't on there, you know. I, just, I thought he would know who it was from, and um, so uh, I, I sent another message to his wife. And it's like, I promise I'm not a hot blonde, I'm just you know. And then um, I was in LA last year, and we went out for lunch. And I, I go around Brett's house, and I meet his wife. <laughs> look, look, I'm not, you know, not a hot blonde. Well, uh, <laughs> she thinks uh, you are his wingman. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, probably one of the upcoming movies, uh, to end this with a movie, uh, that could be interesting for you, just in, in the extension of, of Carnage, could be the Venom movie. Right, right. So are you looking forward to this? Maybe we'll see it? Yeah, I heard some, some rumors that Carnage was going to be in there. Might be, I didn't know. They were, they were talking, I mean, the thing is, this news came out on April 1st, <laughs> so I was like, because uh, they were talking about Woody Harrelson as yeah. Carnage, yeah. so I was like, yeah. that's actually a pretty good choice. Um, yeah, so it, it should be interesting. The, the problem is that some people say, some people say refer back to the, the comics. I think a lot of the DC films have had the problem because it, they're mostly developed by Warner Brothers, who they're like, oh, we don't need to look at the comics, we understand movies. Yeah, and, and what so, is a problem? Yeah, 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 so there's a problem there. Whereas a lot of the Marvel, Marvel movies have been successful because they talk to the comic guys. Uh, I'm hoping that will change because Jeff Johns has now taken on more of a role in the, in the DC movies. So we'll see if that makes a difference. So, um, what, what will the future bring for you? The future will bring DC for me. Really? Yeah. They are uh, no more exclusive more. No, no. I've, uh, DC have been after me for a while. Yeah. And they, they're chasing you. Yes, yes. And the, the good thing about it is that Dan DiDio, who's the publisher at DC, um, he was always wanted to get me there, but I was always exclusive. So we would always meet up for a drink. <laughs> there we go again. Uh, <laughs> I was in the bar. And uh, so we'd always meet up for a drink, and because Dan knew that I wasn't looking for work, we developed a friendship. Um, and you know, we would just talk about favorite artists. We would talk about Ross Andrew, or different things. And so that really developed our friendship. And so at every convention I was going to, I would get in touch with him beforehand and say, "Let's get together for a drink." So like last last April. Uh, in Chicago, not the one just gone before. before. Uh, I said to him, you know, let's meet for a drink. And Dan was like, oh, your exclusive contract is at, at the end of the year. Said, let's meet for breakfast. <laughs> so I was like, oh, what are those meetings? Okay. And uh, he pitched me on the whole idea, the way that DC had gone forward. It was very exciting. Um, so I, I, it felt like the right time to make that decision. <coughs> To, to play the different toy box, really. Um, and, uh, and Marvel were, were fine, you know, they were okay. They, first of all, they didn't want to let me out of that contract. But uh, after a while, they were like, yeah, that's fine. So, they, they had you for, for 14 years. Well, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 
I use the proportion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but um, you, you uh, I, I think you cannot tell about what your first uh, no, director no, no. will be at, at DC. Or yeah, well, the, actually, actually, the first DC work came out this Wednesday. Um, it's a, it was a Green Lantern and um, or um, Andy Dibble was uh, writing it, and it was it was great fun. I mean, I love. On my, on my drawing board at home, uh, on my lamp, it's there. I have a little stuffed Al Jordan, like <laughs> powering up my lamp. So it, it's great to actually draw and bring that to. And then um, they really liked what I did on the annual. And so I'll be teaming up with Dan Jurgens uh, on the issues, the Green Lantern issues as well. And then they talked about other things after that. Um, of other favorite characters. But I mean, one, one of the things that I really wanted to do there, which we might get to at some point, um, is with Greg Rucker, who's one of my favorite writers. Um, we wanted to do um, a daily planning book. Well, that sounds interesting. We wanted to do a daily planning book that is kind of like Gotham Central. Yeah. Um, where it's hard hitting, it's dealing with what do you do as a journalist when Basically, your president can stand up in front of everyone and go, "You write fake news," you know. So it was, it was very interesting to to look at that and develop it, and to turn Jimmy Olsen into a hard-ass photojournalist. And, and um, we got really excited about it. But then it was it was getting difficult to to get Marvel to agree. Yeah. So we missed that window. Yeah. Because yeah. they wanted it as part of the Black Label. Line. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was very mature. It was. Uh, it was really going to be hard um, But now, now we, we talked about it again, and, and Dan DeGio wants to move it more into the DCU, uh, the, the main universe. Um, so we'll see, maybe one day. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward. And, uh, actually, I like you being on, uh, on, on DC because I have been little bit more of a DC fan than a Marvel right. fan for all the time. I have to admit, I probably like in, in the... Yes, you haven't heard of me until today. Yeah, <laughs> pro probably in, in, in the cinema, I probably like Marvel better, but in, right. the, in the comics, I'm, I'm still uh, a little bit of a bigger DC fan. Yeah. Yeah. And the good thing is, as well, it's, it's enabled me to, to play around with superheroes. Yes. Because, because uh, you know, they, they... Editors tend to pigeonhole you into a certain style. Um, they, I was drawing a lot of gritty street level stuff, which which I enjoy a lot. You know, so you know, I they were bringing Iron Fist back. It was going to be more gritty, and so they put me on that. Carnage was before that. Deathlock before that. So it's very much like a you know all these dark characters, sort of thing. and then to, to actually be drawing Green Lantern, where it's superheroes, it's just like well, of course I can do it. I know it does have to do gritty stuff. You know, I enjoy doing the superhero stuff as well. And so only because of your dark soul. You know. I know. I know. Most of the thing is, most of the guys who love doing that stuff, and I, I love doing the supernatural stuff, yeah. like the carnage or whatever, and you, you usually find that those kind of guys are really sweet and nice. <laughs> well, like Mike Curry, who writes most of the horrific stuff ever, and he's like this. Like English English teacher. <laughs> but you find that with comedians, right? I mean, yeah. all the comedians are suicidal. Yeah. <laughs> well, you will see, DC will put you next on the Phantom Stranger. Right. Well, I, yeah, yeah. well actually, they, um, they were pitching me on a Spectre. Oh, Spectre. Well, even, even darker, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, I was actually really intrigued about that. But then they then they you know then wanted me on Green Lanterns. Yeah. I didn't have a problem with that. Alright, so are there any questions uh, in the audience? Yeah I see one at the back, please. Um were the pitching Lobo for you? Um they they haven't really said anything about Lobo actually. The the uh I mean, you, you did the Judge Dredd, so I said, yeah, yeah. Lobo would be kind of... Right. Boring. What do you think personally? Would it fit your style? Would you like to do it? Yeah, I think so. 
In, in Strasbourg next week, uh, Bisley will be there, so uh, we'll oh, talk nice. about that. Uh, we'll, that. That will end up in the bar. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. I mean, Lobo was in the latest Justice League film. Oh, yes. sorry, that was Aquaman. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was the, the other Lobo. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the, the watery Lobo. They, but but they're, they're talking about a Lobo film now for a couple of years. And I'm, Actually, I have read some of the treatments, and I'm really glad they didn't do it. But uh, but still, yeah, in the comic books, uh, I'm waiting for it. I'm a big Lobo fan, so I, right. you alone, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that'd be good fun. That'd be good fun. You have to let them know. You, you have to let them know. You have to say we want. No, seriously, it does work. If 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 people if people can see, it's a fan. If the fans out there can see, like a creator would be good for a book. And, and people get in touch with the publishers, they, they do take notice of that. At least the fans have been the reason that the Sissy logo they created with the New 52 is gone. Right, right. Because uh, nobody needed that one. No, no. Okay, more questions? More logo questions? <laughs> yeah. Hi, um, you often. Uh, US American people talk about uh, the world and they really talk about uh, uh, their own nation in comparison about comic fans. And if we talk about uh, comic fans <coughs> worldwide, how important are uh, comic fans outside the US for you and especially for Marvel? I, I would say that Stefan could uh, answer that more than me uh, because of the Panini. Uh, you know, they publish a lot of these and stuff like that. But for me, I mean, I, I read a lot of comics. I read a lot of European comics. Um, so, uh, you know, I, for, for me, you know, I grew up on, on that stuff. So it's a, it's a totally different aspect. It's very important. It's very important to have fans everywhere. I mean, you know, I've been coming to the German conventions every summer for like six years now. Um, and so it's, it's great just to in a way to become friends with people that you see year in, year out. Um, and so it's very important for me to cultivate that as well. Um, but you know, there's so many European stuff. You, you listen to, the, even to a certain extent, you listen to the news in America. It's very America centric. Uh, usually when I'm working, I, I tend to listen to audiobooks and uh, I, I stream uh, BBC Radio 4. So I get most of my news uh, from the BBC. Um, and so I have more of a, a worldwide look than a lot of people living in America, I would say. Um, so I can't really say, for me it's very important. I can't really say for, for other people. Does that answer the question? Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> Other, just one, other fans in Germany are, uh, or in Europe are different than the fans you meet in They're the lovely. States? They're all lovely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, 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 no actually, I mean, you, uh, actually, one of the nice things is, and this, this may sound very commercial, but one of the nice things is, like, I, I sell uh, original art when I'm doing the signings. And um, there's a real appreciation of art over here. You know, people know there is an original piece, and they love it. And there's a, you do get that sense of appreciation there. Um, because somebody will look at the art, and the prices are on there, and they'll go, okay, I want this. And you take the art out, and they give you the money. Whereas in America, they're like, eh, what, what, what's the best price you can give me? And it's like, well, that's the best price. It's right there. <laughs> that's actually because uh, we do not have uh, such a flood of uh, artists around here you know, right. selling their stuff. So the, I think the Americans probably a little bit. Uh, we were talking the other the other evening actually. Of, we were trying to come up with more American, more German creators who are working for the American market. Um, well, now are two. Well, we we've got Nick Klein. Yeah, one. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else know? No, well, Marco Djurcevic, who is not really well, he German. lives in Berlin. Yeah, he lives in Berlin. And also, um, um, Viktor Bogdanovic, who is from Switzerland, but lives in Berlin. Right. So, those are the half Germans. Does anybody know anybody else? <laughs> no. Nah. The thing is, I mean, like, there's some, there's some great German books out there. I mean, 
like Reinhard Kleist is fantastic, fantastic graphic novels. Um, but they tend to be more in the, the graphic novel rather than the comics. Um, yeah, we were trying to think. If you, if you think of what, shout out the day. <laughs> yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, Ingo works for the Star Wars stuff. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So, the question about the creation part, so if you were page a day, Yes, yeah, you get the script. Um, the script from the script. From the layout itself, so you're thinking Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, I, I can... I always find it strange when other people can't do this. Like, I will read a script and I can see it in my head straight away. I can see what it should look like on the page. Um, and so, layout-wise, I'll, I'll just do panel shapes. And then I'll just go straight to the page. I don't really do that many layouts. I'll lay it out in here and then put it down. Um, and so, yeah, you, you get the script. Um, and it's all different kinds of scripts. Like, Mike Carey writes a really detailed script, which I really enjoy. Because, uh, you know, you just chew on Mike's sentences. It's great. Uh, and then working with Dan Jurgens, it's the first time I've, I've worked from a kind of plot style script where most of the creative choices are left up to me. Um, but, but Dan is, a, is an artist, you know, so he, he understands that visual language. Um, so that's actually kind of interesting that we, we've chosen to work in that way. And it was a bit daunting to start with, because I've never worked in that way before. But it's, it's been really conducive to creativity. What is um, you told us you read a lot of, uh, of European uh, yeah. comic books. Which ones? Um, I, I, love, I love the work of Leo, uh, the Aldebaran uh, guy, the, the words of Aldebaran. Um, I love a lot of Christoph Beck's stuff. Uh, in fact, I, I probably did like four pages of Christoph Beck on a Prometheus um, story for him. Um, and also, um, uh, Matthew Lafray did uh, Long John Silver, which is just fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's so, many, so, much, so much stuff out there, which, which I truly enjoy. Um, uh, there's other German creators. Who's the guy who did Baby in Black, the, the Beatles thing? Uh, anyway, it was a German. Um, it was uh, about Astrid, uh, what's it basically the Beatles? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, that, was, that was a good, that was a good thing as well. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, so I'm, not, I'm, I'm very open about my, my comic book reading. I don't just concentrate on the, the American market. All right. They don't understand that you have to put so much work in beforehand until you get to that point. Um, and, I, and I think the, the internet is it's valuable to, to get your work out there um, and for people to, to notice that stuff. Do you have, do you have something like that yourself? Or? Yes, but nothing I would do with two channels. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to get you to give everybody your website. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's totally valuable. It, it's, it's, it's a great process for getting it under editors' noses. You know, in, instead of sending photocopies of work, you can just say, oh, here's my sign. Go there and check it out. And, and if you do it on a regular basis, if you update it on a regular basis, they can see that you can make a deadline, which sometimes is more important than, than the quality of the work. I mean, if you're doing these fantastic pages and you do two per month, 
je nach der Entwicklung. So, noch weitere Fragen? Keine weiteren Fragen? Sehr schön. Dann sind Oh, eine noch. Na, okay. Dann machen wir noch eine. Wir machen noch eine. Komm, eine machen wir noch. Um, do you ever do non-comic art just for your leisure? Just the little landscapes? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah. oh, it's, it's, it ends up being comic art. <laughs> it, it's like, um, um, I, I, do, I do other work as well sometimes when uh, I, I've worked with uh, musicians as well. Um, there's, a, there's a band, they, they call themselves a combat disco band um, called Apparatchik. Um, and they, it, it's almost like a super group. So it's Magna for a harmon, it's the keyboard player from a harp. Um, it's the bass player from. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Coldplay. Uh, it's a bass player from Coldplay. Um, it's Jonas Bjerg, he's a lead singer in Mew, which is a Danish band. Um, and so these guys have this, this band and they do art shows. You know, they go to uh, art galleries and, do, and, and dress up weirdly and do all these kind of light shows and all this kind of stuff. And so they, they, I've worked with them on developing like a comic strip for them. And, um, and then when I got to chat to Max, in, in Norway, because he's a fine artist as well. So I met him in, in Norway and we, we talked about other ideas we'd like to work on together. And, and we, we wanted to work for the, the national, uh, the Norwegian Royal Opera as well for a show. Um, so there's things like that. And then Max got in touch with me again and wanted something for the latest AHA to a, so they could project her in the background. So we're always and talking to talking to other creative types, talking to musicians, it's amazing because you can talk to other comic guys and you speak the same language, you can almost finish their sentences. But then talking to another creative artist of a different that they do a different thing, you, you're just sparking ideas backwards and forwards. It's brilliant. I love them. Sorry. No, no, no. Thank you very much. Okay, dann sind wir quasi am Ende. Wir gehen jetzt gleich zurück zum Panini-Stand. Da wird er noch ein kleines Stündchen signieren. Wie gesagt, das hier gibt es. Wer noch was von dem haben will, hat äh, jetzt dann quasi noch die Chance. Ansonsten, wenn euch unser kleines Palabra gefallen hat, äh, schaut nochmal bei Panini Comics TV rein. Äh, so eine kleine, nette YouTube-Show, die ich mache, wo ich ganz viele Künstlergespräche habe. Das heißt, wir haben bisschen zuhören möchte, wie ich noch mit anderen Künstlern parliere, es ist natürlich noch ein bisschen kürzer, der findet dort noch den einen oder anderen sehr interessanten äh, Menschen. Und ansonsten möchte ich mich quasi bei euch bedanken und ich, dank, äh, ich denke, wir alle bedanken uns hier bei Mike Perkins.
All right, okay, good. Well, we'll have some good ones for you. So um, let's just um, jump right in. I'll let you just land it. We arrive in Toronto. And this is roughly how it goes in Jeff's studio. And I find that quite um, well, when, when I visited you, Jeff, I was uh, not only blown away because there's some really beautiful comics art you have, but um, over the years I've visited a few studios by, by comic creators, and I learned that there are basically three types of how their studio walls or their walls at home are, are filled. Some of them have nothing that even resembles any comic art or anything like that. Some mostly have their own art. And then there's a studio like yours, where it's almost exclusively art by other artists, which I found quite interesting. Some of it is actually art they make in collaboration with you, but a lot of it is just art by other artists. So my impression was that you are an artist who takes other artists also very serious as a source of inspiration, maybe on the part of the a fan. So what does it mean to you on the other art here? Maybe you can tell us a tiny bit about the most important pieces in your studio. Uh, yeah, well, <coughs> I mean, I think it's just, uh, uh, I like to be surrounded by things that inspire me and, and things that develop me. And I know like comics, first and foremost, and there's been so many different uh, cartoonists and artists who inspired me in different stages of my life and I'm now I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I get to uh, often meet many of them now and think it's known as cures or at least I you know I sit and often collaborate with them and then uh, so I've, I've assembled this collection of artwork that kind of it started uh, when I was I guess first doing I guess no I wouldn't have been after S T and it was just starting to speak to you. Um, <coughs> My studio was not this, it was just in the basement of our house. It was like, maybe as wide as this, and there's like a, a washing machine, a cat litter, <laughs> and a drawing desk. And I, the first show I did uh, as a published character was like 2005 in New York with my self published graphic novel, Lost Dogs, and uh, sitting across from me with Joe Satan. I don't know if was Joe Satan. Mm -hmm. Pretty popular uh, cartoon comic artist in the 70s and 80s. He did a lot of pre nineteen stuff that I read when I was a kid. So he auditioned him to do a little pre nineteen drawing for me. That was the first one that hung in my that little studio. And then I, I kind of got the bug for original artwork and, and, and I kind of had this list, this stream list of all the different artists I loved and trying to get one piece from each of them. So as my studio sort of grew, my collection kind <laughs> of grew to fill it. So now it's pretty good to see it's kind of like a, almost like a comic art gallery. Yeah, it's, it's like almost time to move again. Yeah. To a large studio. Well, like, I, now I rotate, so I'll, I'll have all this stuff on the walls, and then every like, six months I'll, I'll take half of it down and put up pieces that are in <laughs> portfolios. So. But yeah, I just like being surrounded by all that different artwork. It's inspiring you know, to be around and to, to remember all the stuff I love as a kid and all the stuff I love now. And, uh, Remember that I get to do that every day is pretty special. Yeah, here we see some works actually fun, in particular that you can also actually see it in the show because Jeff was uh, generous enough not only to give us 120 pieces of original art that he created, but a few that other artists created that normally uh, are in the studio. So now there's an empty space where you can see the cover of Descender there, just uh, there by the space boy and the robot. Yeah, the Dustin. One of the artists I work with, Michael Sender, is he's a, such a great guy and uh, he's so generous. And every time I see him, I really love that page. The next thing I think he's going to send it to me. So. <laughs> it's pretty nice. <laughs> and then, even the table that you're working on, I found that quite impressive. Um, that's that's sort of a sort of hip, hip level, level or table. You're, you're working in a scan, right? I used to sit, but then I started just getting so stiff all the time. Couple, one day I decided to raise my desk up and I didn't draw standing up. And I found it so much more free. Did the drawing as well. Just so much, you can move around and kind of engage physically more. And I don't get tired. And now, now I can't, I can barely dress, so you gotta feel so. Uh, it's weird. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a lot of ink on the wall, you can see that. Yeah. So this is the table where you actually do the drawing and the splashing and yeah. the ink and the watercolor. Yeah, this beautiful David King page. And thank God it's raining and it's like this one. Again, I don't ever call one like that when I move up. And then uh, another thing that I found um, uh, interesting.
and if you're looking through your school, you notice like a little uh, sort of shelf like that holds comic books. And so when I say comic books, it doesn't mean books the way we said books, but it plays like magazine like yeah. serialized yeah. comics. Yeah, that's an interesting thing for those of you, I'll just brought it to you. Um, because, I mean, here in Germany, people know you mostly from your publications that were collected as a book, either created as a book to start with, or collected and then published as a book with graphic novels. But in, um, in North America, most people would have contact with your work in this form in the beginning, like. Yeah, considering mm -hmm. stuff like that, and they're collected to the, what you guys read, which are like graphic novels. No, no, no. Tax breaks. 
So the industry is really moving in. Like, well, I can take this film program and maybe that's an avenue for looking at there's actually there are these jobs after working in the industry and um, maybe I should find a way to use that as a way to tell these stories that I want to tell. So I I, I went to Toronto and uh, did this film program at the university and um, I think I think I read a lot of those stories. One of the things that I, I apply is you know, more later, but the more I get the program, the more I just miss it's driving, and the more I just comics, the more I just, uh, comics is just a very direct medium where you can sit at a desk and write and draw something all by yourself exactly the way you want it, and that is exactly where the reader gets in their hands. You know, when film is not that, there's, it's a collaboration, there's, it's very expensive, and there's all these different people you need to work with. Yeah, that vision through, and that didn't really scrape the time that I was realizing. Um, and also, the movie drama I started to get exposed to other comics that maybe I wasn't that big. Because I really had all I had access to was Marvel and DC stuff as a kid, and then as a teenager, I think the first wave of Rubio comics kind of came at the right time to kind of just engage in new comics. But when I went to Toronto, there were really good comic shops, and the guy who was so sorry to death. Then I suddenly discovered uh, all these European cartoons, all these South American cartoons, and just Indian underground stuff. That I, so my passion for the media got reignited in a big way as well. So by the end of, near the end of the film program, I promise this is all the this, this question. No, no. Uh, I did decide to write like the last year that I was just wanted to do comics. And, uh, and I started working on this story, which, um, well, first of all, the first two, I did make two short films, and the first one, they both featured characters that are now in the falls. And so I had these characters in this, this sort of, uh, this, the concept of the story since 96 or 97, when I was, you know, 19, 20 years old. And I started, when I got out of school, I started just drawing every day, and I was working in, uh, as a cook in the kitchen. So I'd, I'd work at night and then draw all day, and I did that for about six years before I published anything, just slowly getting a little bit better. And the book I was working on was basically what is now the game falls. Um, but I just, at one point, I just completely broke down on it and uh, it kind of put it aside and moved on to other things and eventually kind of came to Essex County and sort of discovered the funny kind of my voice for that book. But in some of the characters and ideas from yeah, those short films and these original movie comics I self published, when I started talking about Greg Ed Sorrentino, the artist, um, we were working on our all together. Yeah, here's an original that you yeah, brought that's for us that Andrea did for yeah. another story. So we had Green Arrow at DC and then we did uh, Old Man Logan and Marvel. And we had a really good chemistry together. Uh, but we wanted to do our own thing. And, and thinking of something I could do for, for hours with his style and sensibilities, suddenly those old ideas that I was sick of 10 years ago kind of got exciting and they went back in and going. Uh, and I kind of reimagined that, you know, this is something I could when I was 20. So it's not, it wasn't great, so like I had to rework it a lot and, and stuff and, and bring new things to it. But, so yeah, long story short, Amy Falls, even though it's the newest book, kind of has the longest, the oldest sort of genesis mm -hmm. from my storytelling, great storytelling days. Yeah, these are some of the covers, and it's just starting, so you still have a chance to jump on and uh, come, like, join the readership. And um, talk about Andrew Sorrentino and the uh, original that we showed you. Showing you that's another original that's in the exhibition. I'd, I'd like to use that to sort of to look a little closer at some of the other originals because, as I said earlier, we, we're still imagining you're still in your studio, we're still in Jeff's studio, and, and in March we went through your drawers and through your folders and looked at the originals to, to find a group that would work for the exhibition. And then we also, of course, um, found a beautiful selection of images from Essex County, which I guess was your breakthrough work where you really found your voice as a narrator. How was it after like, over 15 years like, to sort of, well, how is it now revisiting this work? What, 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 is this, uh, what do you feel like when, when you look at these images? It's, it's been kind of interesting because um, not only were we kind of going through that with our work from Essex, which is now about a decade old, like most of the pages of the scan, they're all the best. So that was interesting, but at the same time as we were doing that, I've also been working on uh, the uh, television 
show for us to scan. Uh, oh, you're working on the script, right? Yes. So it's the adaptation of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I had, when I finished the book, I never reread any of my books, and I never even looked at my books. I find very painful to do that. <laughs> uh, and I just, I'm always just on to the next one, you know, which sometimes is not a great thing. Moments in the form. But, anyways, this work now that it's like enough time has passed, it's interesting going back to it and not just going through the other people, also kind of trying to get my head back into that world so like, I can write again again for the television series. And I think enough time has passed that I, that I can do that. But my more recent stuff, I saw another time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this was, was a book that you basically created all on your own, right? After Ashtray, you decided you're going to. Like get you closer to your own life as a source, I understand, right? To your own yeah, experiences. And about five years of trying to offer different stories. And mostly, you know, when you're kind of starting out, you're, uh, in my case, like, I kind of tried to emulate things that I liked. So I was like, whatever book I was going to do, I'd try to do something like that. And, you know, they just never would work out. I'd find little things that worked, but I never felt successful, you know, until. I kind of got frustrated at one point, and, uh, and I think maybe I'd been away from home for about five or six years at that point, so I kind of think back on where I came from and my family and childhood. A little bit of distance, you kind of start to evaluate it in a different way. Um, and uh, so I decided instead of doing all these stories that were, you know, whatever, sometimes I'll start over where I came from, something more honest. And, and as soon as I did that, everything started. That's like really felt yeah, kind of my voice there. All the themes that now are weaker than all my work. I think I kind of discovered what they do in that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just read that whole book. The whole first volume, it was originally published just three volumes in the States. And I read the whole first volume just on my own, thinking I would self publish that. And, but I did send it to three publishers um, just to see what kind of feedback I got. And, uh, it was in the Rush for Image Standard the top shelf and drawing board uh, and the uh, top shelf was very enthusiastic and, and something like publishing it for them and then right away they kind of gave me support to start working on the second volume and, uh, and that was sort of I guess the meaning of my professional career. Mm -hmm. so was, oh gosh. But when we're in the studio I found it quite charming as a few so the characters also from your books that the white creator who also an artist. Yes, yeah, she, she, she creates things like this. Uh, so she often does my characters for me. And, uh, <laughs> and they're sort of my favorite things in the studio now. Yeah. yeah, nice. And when, when you go to the show, you see that in the beginning we have Lost Dogs, as was mentioned, we have original pages from Essex County, which was sort of the breakthrough. And then we have uh, this page in the show, which was an early design of the series, which you were meaning to create yourself. But then things took a different turn, but now this is probably your big, the, yeah. sort of the start of your probably biggest success at the moment. Right? Yeah, I think so. It's, um, so right after I was in I was kind of trying to think of what to do next, you know. And, uh, um, you know, I grew up reading all these superhero comics, and I had a real love for not only the comics themselves, but sort of the history of, of the superhero comics and the history of, of the creators who created all these kind of formative works that I loved as a kid. So I kind of came up with this idea, well, at the time I never thought I really knew that I would work for DC or Marvel myself because, you know, my art style is not what they publish and, you know, I just didn't, it didn't, it wasn't really a goal of mine. Um, but I did kind of want to do something that was like a love letter to superheroes. Uh, so I thought, well, what if I did this to man that I could for this And so I came up with this idea of Black Hammer. And I was, that, that was the only thing I drew was a graphic novel after Essex County. But um, around the same time, uh, some editors at Vertigo, DC Vertigo, uh, kind of really, really like Essex County, and they asked me to pitch some stuff. And I pitched, well, first this graphic novel, and then my which was sort of uh, a reimagining of an invisible man story. And then from that, the uh, Sweet Tooth, the series, and they got green lit. And I ended up doing that. So this kind of just stayed in my sketchbooks for about, you know, about one of the other 10 years. But, but I, again, I just, I had kind of developed the main idea and the characters were pretty much what I ended up with now. I always loved them, so 
Yeah, and then you, like at some point, you just pulled it out of your drawer again. Yeah, well, the, the key point is that uh, after, well, I was working at Sweet Tooth, uh, I started that in 2009, and I think it was 2013 or something, I think. Um, and, uh, and somewhere in that, the editors at DC Comics kind of took over and asked them to start playing but it makes me super gross stuff. And, you know, I thought that would be something to try, so we did, and we kind of took it off as well. And, um, and I did that for, you know, I think it took me four or five years to so simply with DC and then with Marvel did. And, and there came a point near the end of that where I thought, um, as much as, as that's fun, uh, I, I kind of got tired of getting my ideas to corporations who where I would never see any benefit from it, you know. Um, so I thought, well, if I'm writing all these comics stories that are artists anyway, in addition to what I'm doing, why not do them with myself, create your own stuff? So I kind of went away from DC and Marvel a bit and created Black Hammer and Descender. And, I, you know, I really, these were both projects I would have drawn myself at some point, but I can't really do it all in one at a time. It's just because it takes so long to draw them out. Um, but doing this allows me to do multiple projects at a time. Obviously, I like to do a lot of the main books that I can jump between and it kind of stimulates me creatively. Um, it also allows me to collaborate with other people, whereas when you're working alone, if I can create it, it can also be, you know, it's nice to have a conversation with someone else. And how does it feel? I mean, you've collaborated with people on characters that were franchise characters, like, like um, characters that other people had invented before you, right? But, but, but now you have these characters that you created that you also actually in the beginning drew, but now you in this case have to just get, hand it all over to Dean Orson as the artist. Is that also liberating or is it scary? Or it's, it's, always, it's always a little weird first, but um, as soon as you see the artwork and start to come back, it's, it's so good that it, 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 it goes away pretty quickly. Because often those, the projects I do with an artist are things I probably would excel at. As an art, like my, my art style is very distinct and it has its limitations and I, I'm not really good at it. For just an example, like I wouldn't be good at drawing this either. I can't do all those robots and all the, the you know, the architecture. That's not my strength point, so that's much better suited for the plot. Yeah. Uh, Black Camera was a little tough because that one was a little more. I had actually started drawing it a little bit. So. Mm -hmm. But again, once you see, often you just see Dean brings his own personality to it now too, and it becomes something more than what we do, or so, you know, it becomes something different. And it surprises me, and I like that. Yeah. Do you correct a lot when you work with another artist? Do you have any artistic corrections? Or? I don't think I've ever asked for I'm lucky enough now that I can pick and choose flatters that I do, mm -hmm. and work I really like, you know, trust. I don't really have friends of mine too, so. If you're working with people who, whose work you already like and know and trust, you just like to do the thing. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I'd like to look a little closer. Um, let's just imagine ourselves back into your studio and one of the drawers, uh, there were these like, sketchbooks uh, of your book, The Underwater Welder, in German Denta, Hase Schweizer. There's a whole room in the exhibition dedicated to this work. And um, I found it particularly interesting because we, we found a few sketchbooks. I don't know how much you expect from some other words, but here you see them quite a few. And what I found interesting is that on the one hand, you saw these textbooks where you were just sort of designing first images and how images could be spread out over the page. And, but then there were other um, pages or other books actually where you were actually writing it like a film script. So I'm just wondering, since you were um, coming from film originally and you're a writer, at the same time you were also someone who thinks visually. When you create a new story, to what extent actually does it start as a written script? To what extent does it sometimes more start as a visual finding process? Or? Uh, it varies from project to project. Generally, I'm not going to draw in the book myself, but I know that it's mostly all developed and through my work. But if it's a graphic novel or a comic series, I can draw myself. It's usually the writing and the artwork are not really a separate. Thing anymore, they're kind of the same part of the same process, so it's a little careful. We kind of always doing both together and kind of feeding each other. So there's a lot of more visual thinking going on as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, and especially with a book like this, and, and often your books, they, they have a very strong visual aspect. In this case, there's a lot of underwater scenes, a lot of scenes of, of this character. It's sort of a mystery, psychological mystery, family drama, a lot of underwater scenes. So it looks to me like a lot of that visual, you actually use to express emotional things that you were going through at the time. I think you even said that for the introduction that we have in the, in the exhibition. Yeah, I think um, most people presume that Essex County is my most autobiographical work, but it's actually not really that autobiographical. It was set in the place where I grew up, but the characters and stories are mostly fictional. You know? mm -hmm. But Underwater Mother probably is the most, in some ways, autobiographical because it was all about, uh, I guess, I can't remember what year I said. It was right around the time my wife and I were trying to make that decision that whether or not to have children and, and you know, that's a big life change and, and all the things that come with that and I was feeling a lot of anxiety about that and fear and the things you feel before you actually become a parent. And uh, at the same time, uh, well, I, I think I must have still been working in the restaurant or something. One of the other parents I was working with his brother was getting to be an underwater doll there. Search Canada on these oil rigs. I never heard of this as a profession, and he started telling me that it's completely insane. Like, it's a really dangerous job, and it's insane. And I started to Google everything, and it's just so visually striking these helmets, these tubes, and the, you know, it's just visually really cool. I started drawing that in my books. Somehow the two things clicked where I started realizing that was such a perfect metaphor for like, the pressure of a man in Canada and his job. Where he's, Underwater, I'm literally feeling this pressure. And then there was some image where I saw this little guy, this little diver guy with those air tubes, and it was like a umbilical cord, and it just all sort of clicked as this visual metaphor. So, yeah, that's, that's what I mean by the tubes and the other kind of They're just sort of building together. The whole thing started to put together. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'd like to, you want some water? Oh, yes. Let's maybe have a quick look at your tools, because I, once again, I found that interesting in comparison to, to other artists. When you go to their studio, often you see a big screen and a big tablet and a big scanner and, then, of course, pencils and all that. But in your case, it's basically four tools, paper, a hand, and then you know, they, these two actual tools. an arm. There's an arm. Yeah, there's an arm. <laughs> but they're really old-fashioned when it comes to the actual uh, creation process of the Yeah, well, when I started drawing, obviously we didn't have tablets. Yeah. You know, I was born when I was a kid of the 80s, so we didn't have that stuff. So I was just drew a paper. And uh, I know when I started really getting serious about learning how to make comics, I didn't know, even though now there were tons of people my age trying to do the same thing in Toronto that I easily could have found and learned from. I, I was really a vacuum when I was doing it. I was working in a restaurant and I'd come out from school and I didn't know anyone who made comics. So I was just sort of, it was all trial and error, trying to figure out how to do it and what tools to use. And I remember the day that when I saw the expressions, that was like, like a revelation. I was like, you know, so I was buying brushes and I was always trying to get my hands. So that was all part of that tactical of learning. And that's, I, that's all part of how I learned to draw. I can't, I have a better time now doing it on my computer. You know, I just miss that. I miss the messy tactile mm -hmm. uh, drawing. I should just record my voice now. All of us just spend so much time looking at screens all day. You know, the last thing I want to do when I'm making art is look at another screen. You know? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I'm sure that you have a lot of shops around the Personal stories grounded in real life. 
But then Sweet Tooth opened up a whole new universe as a storyteller as well as in terms of international success. So um, how did you approach this story? Well, I had done, I had done Essex County and um, I was having a really hard time deciding what to do next year. I was a 20 year old black never. I needed to do something different. And I obviously want to shop work and you know, I do a tons of it now. But, so I really wanted to do something that was really different than Essex. And it was like a, a science fiction story or a genre or a big adventure story. Uh, and when, when Gordy Ross would pitch that, obviously they publish in a monthly format. I don't want to write like graphic novels. They're more like, it's more like constructing a novel or a film. Um, this is much more serialized than you want, so um, I'm totally getting off topic. What was your question? No, how, how did you approach this? Yeah, thing? Yeah. So, yeah, I was just I was trying to do some sort of new, new, new way of working. I mean, yeah, this is where the format of the month would be boom. What is the, the deadline? It's first of all, you have to do 20 pages a month that are going to be and uh, it just started to tell stories in a different way using that serialized format. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Using cliffhangers and building and story arts. And, and I really enjoyed that and I enjoyed the ongoing kind of feel of it. But I, I never thought that Sweet Tooth would last because, I mean, I only had done essays. And my art style, like I said, it's not what you would normally see in DC publish or even very you know, it's a bit raw. Uh, so I thought, if this book lasts like eight issues, I'll be lucky. So I, uh, I knew the ending right away and I was, I was planning on getting canceled and I thought I'd do this only issue thing. But, and how many to the end? Was it 40 or something? Yeah, I thought I, I, that was my choice. I didn't know what it was supposed to sound like. So I kept the same ending. I just was able to extend the adventure for 30 issues. <laughs> but uh, it, it was kind of interesting because it sort of bridged the gap for me between indie and sort of literary comics readers and uh, the more mainstream comics fans who buy all the superhero stuff, which is kind of how it bridged that and go with the bigger readership. Yeah. yeah, we have fun. The first 22 pages were just quite uh, spectacular. I find that you actually kept them because over the years you sold a lot of pages of your work. Uh, so they're probably in hundreds and hundreds of uh, private collections all over the world. But the full first one of uh, yeah, the yeah. full first and last issue. Yeah, so you can see the first 22 pages in the original in the exhibition and in German. Printouts and then which is quite spectacular because you can sort of walk through the book there in a way. And um, I would have liked to include this in the show, but it was too fragile. Here yeah, we see Gus, the main character of Sweet Tooth. Yeah. Once again, created by your wife, yes. Desi Anthony. Yeah, Gus is even the opposite the center character. Yeah. It's a, it's a portrait of me by Gus. Yeah, that's the center. That's actually, yeah, that's, um, that's the image that's one for me in the exhibition portrait of Jeff by Destiny Yen. He finds a very funny drama, he does it a lot. He thinks I look like a uh, HBO craft. <laughs> Uh, talking about Dustin, uh, we have um, two of the originals that he created for you. A cover, Curry Sender, number one, and an uh, internal page. Yeah. And it's just so amazing how, on the one hand, I mean, this is a story for those of you who don't know, that's a sort of sci-fi space opera about robot wars, space wars, and a little robot boy called Tim and his evil twin brother, and there's some really adventurous stuff. Yeah. So sort of developing out of it. And um, the images are just so fragile and so beautiful and so delicate, but the story is sometimes really brutal and really rough. But at the same time, also delicate. So I'm just wondering to what extent uh, does the art, and you know it, and he's the artist, how, how much do you take that into account when you write a story as it continues? Yeah, a lot. I mean, the center came out from uh, us and then both at DC. We never worked with anybody to provide each other stuff. And uh, actually, the way Dustin and I met was kind of funny because we were doing a panel sort of like this at Comic Con over here, but they have sort of a table you know, in the city at the end. And Dustin was some design I didn't know at the time. And then someone came late to the panel, another writer, so we had to kind of push our chairs over, and I just wasn't thinking how to push my chair over the stage end. It's like, <laughs> Dustin's crappy. And that's why I met Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe at this point, I would like to um, show this picture, seeing you actually standing at your desk and use the opportunity to open up the panel and see if there are any questions that you have. I have a few more pictures we can look at, but yeah, I just want to open up the panel. And please, if there's a question, I'll just give you a microphone, because then that way you can also get in your questions. Hi. Um, I should say I'm a big fan of your Moonlight story. And could you lose some sentences about how that came to fruition and how that's come to life? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, so I had worked at DC for like five years exclusively, and I guess this I guess I'm up 2012 or I don't remember right now. But I switched over to Marvel for a while and I was talking to Axel Alonso, who was the editor in chief at the title potential projects and Warren Ellis had just had his little six issue thing which was really really well done. Um, I don't know, I think Axel I said only you could do some at some point and I just started thinking about that. You know, all what I think of Moon Knight. So that's a character I the history of that character I always really admire because I don't think it feels like I shame and you have done much shame. So I love the original stuff from the seventies and you know, like the Warren had done so I just started to think of I get a to those guys. Uh, and they, they really liked it. And that book really, out of all the Marvel stuff I did, it was mostly going to be created on books. I think it's pretty much going on that. But I think the real, it, with many of those collaborations, what I do my career is that I, I can choose my own library, but sometimes when you get stuff at Marvel, you can you always choose, like you put together with someone off of my editor. Sometimes it works really well, sometimes. You know, it doesn't work as well. This is a case for just great small ideas and great color and colors and I just clicked it. It's like lightning in a bottle or just everything just was easy to work with. So that was probably my favorite project. It was a great book. Any more questions or remarks at this point? We'll have another chance later. But in case, yes, just a moment. Thank you. 
peace and uh, you know, all the other stuff I was writing, all the spirit stuff, and then December, everything was a genre work. I was needed to, for my own sake, I need to make sure I got back to it, something like that again. I was more grounded and, and kind of back to where I started, you know, just because you don't want to lose that either, because that's important. And, uh, so yeah, it was just, I wanted to do, just wanted to get back to mm -hmm. a story that didn't have great guys and uh, yeah, it was pretty mm -hmm. cool. Set. And it's interesting, it has some of the features that we can find in Essex County. It has a small town community, it has people sort of struggling with internal issues, but here it has a very, very different kind of level of harshness, of, of intensity of the struggle. There's also hockey scenes, ice hockey, as we say here, but they're a lot more brutal and, and, and cruel and mean, and it seems like this is sort of a rougher version of Essex County in some ways.
railroad tracks and he roasted them and died and covered it up in the 60s. And so the thing of course found that the cover of the original article in the 60s when this came out. And there were these 10 songs based on it. And he, he, got, he was a fan of Essex County and contacted me for how long ago I wanted to do the graphic novel based on the songs. Uh, and I just laughed with your rough neck at that point, which also deals with some similar themes and issues, so it's sort of two coincidence. And uh, yeah, so that ends up here. Well, we can talk more about yeah, the intent and everything else. But let's worry about that. Yeah, we just have a few minutes left, but let me just jump over. Um, oh, actually, I, I want to ask one thing about this. Uh, I'll do that in a minute. Um, I'm really proud of this one. <laughs> <laughs> breaking news like just a few days ago but first before that I just quickly want to point out that um, Jeff and a really wonderful team of other Canadian artists, publishers, comic festival organizers and so on will be here until tomorrow in the, the Lupenza and Jeff will be doing two more signings tomorrow. He will sign at the Toronto Comic Arts Festival section in the Lupenza from 10 to 12 and then at the Mini Comics tomorrow from 1.30 to 3. He'll be signing there, and um, uh, yeah, that's the signing event at the Canadian sort of uh, pavilion, and then there's a bunch of other great artists who will also do lots of things like light drawing, signing, and so on. Here's the signing stage for Rick Fox, will be there, next with Gerald, our magic, Stephen Shannon. So make sure you go there, the little folder I distributed it has um, more information on that. There is another talk tomorrow at 11 o'clock, what's the essence of Canadian comics? The images by Jeff, he won't be on the panel because he has um, signing commitments at the same time in the same room. But there's going to be an interesting group of people to talk about all this. And then, as I said, tonight there's a screening of Secret Path, 45 minute animated film with all the songs by Gord Downey at 9.30 at the Lambisch Spiele. Some of the pages of Secret Path are also in the exhibition, and one of the songs is on display there, so you can uh, get a feel for the Secret Path there. But yeah, let's quickly, before we open up for one or two last questions, let's quickly look at the great news. Because um, Hit Girl is a character created by Mark Millar, and, and uh, it's from the series Kick Ass. Mark Millar is, is quite famous for creating a lot of very successful comic series. And just a few days ago, the news broke that you are taking on this character and bringing her to Canada. Yes, it's a four issue. It's just a four issue. Yeah, it's hard. So, and yeah, she's supposed to be a different country. Each, when you should write, it takes over. So, of course, I have to do it in Canada. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it's just a lot of fun. I, I, I deal with a lot of Canadian sort of things in the body, same work, and uh, I treat it very seriously. So, this was my chance to like, take every Canadian cliche stereotype and have that girl shoot it in the face. It's just cathartic and fun. And we have a bunch of drama with me. Yeah, she has drama, but she has a lot of fun. For me, the office is to get to work with a bit more of a resilience. She's a genius and I've loved this work for a long time. So when Mark said he would draw it, I thought this is a bad thing. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Well, having a time when we should. Come to a close here and see if there are any more last minute questions. We have five minutes left. Yes. Uh, you talked about um, making money for your guests for quite some years. Do you think it would have turned out very different if you uh, had done it back like then? And as a writer, do you think that it's a certain story or a certain genre and a certain point of time to really take off? Um, well, the first part, I'm sure it would have been black and white and a lot different. Different person, and so it's hard to know how it would be different. But also, I, I ended up writing a lot of career grounds from our own DC between the time I came up with it and the time I actually started working on it. My, my perception of that changed dramatically, uh, and all the frustration I felt while doing that, I get suddenly let go and do things the way I wanted to do. So, yeah, it could definitely impact that. Um, I, I didn't quite get this out of the so, do, do you think that this certain uh, topic needs that? Do, do you think whether it's a certain topic or um, um, needs a certain point of time? Do you think that um, as it's now should be uh, successful today, or the center should be uh, successful 10 years ago? Um, 
Cookies sind eine Produktion der Comic Community. Hier im Blog gibt es alle möglichen Informationen und alle Links zum Podcast. Natürlich könnt ihr uns auch bewerten bei iTunes oder bei podcast.de. Zudem gibt es unsere Episoden bei YouTube. Zudem findet ihr uns auf Facebook und auf Twitter. Kommentiert im Blog unter der jeweiligen Episode oder schickt uns Nachrichten über das Kontaktformular. Vielen Dank.